So we're on our faith journey of having a life of faith. A life of faith. And what do I mean by a life of faith? Life of faith is, we have little sayings in the, in the church, like, um, I'm a person of faith. Well, what does that mean? Well, I believe in Jesus. Well, what do you believe in Jesus for? Right? It says, <laughs> it says that, that the devil believes there's a God. What good does it do just to just to, to believe that he exists? No, you, you need to you need to believe that there's a there that there is a God, and Hebrew says that he's a faithful rewarder to those that seek him. Right? You 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 have to understand. You have to believe in everyday life. You live the life of faith. The just, the justified, shall live by faith. And what does that mean? That means. Becoming dependent on the faithful one. You become dependent on the faithful one. And the flesh does not like being dependent on anyone. The flesh is the wise one. The flesh is the prideful one. The flesh is the one that lives my life my way until the flesh cannot perform, cannot do, cannot gives up, you're, you're at your wit's end, and then you try to have faith in God. That's a bad way to live. There are so many people that don't, haven't be, believed God for anything until he's the last resort. And the Bible says that we are supposed to be people of faith. Every aspect of your life you're breathing in now, you're breathing out right now. It should be by faith. God's the one that gave you air, air to breathe. God is the, is the one that sustains us. We've seen in the, that the Word itself is what's holding all things together, the Bible says. Right? And science proves that. They don't understand why these, our atoms, the, the molecular structure that, that makes up all living matter, stays together. It should Pull apart. You know, the whole universe is expanding still. Because God said, light be, and light was, and light is still being. And it's the word of God that holds us together. Jesus is holding all of us together. He was there in the garden. You know that? God says, let us make man in our image. There's a, there's a good chance that Jesus was the one that walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. We don't know that. He showed, he showed up and had a meal with Abraham. He's the eternal one. He is, he is the wisdom that created all living things, created all things that are seen. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore... Be imitators of God. Okay, that's all you need, you need, need to know. Go home. That's, that's enough for, of a lifetime right there, right? How do I become an imitator of God? How do I imitate God? And, and what's great is God hasn't left us with no answers. He's given us Jesus. Jesus came as a man... He came, the eternal one, he, he, he separated himself, he laid down everything that made him God, and he became a man. Jesus didn't live a sinful life. Jesus didn't live a victorious life. Jesus didn't live the life that we lead, read about because he was God. Because if he did, that, there's no hope for any of us. Jesus was God, but he lived as a man. Jesus had to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He didn't do any mighty works until he was baptized with power from on high. Think about that. And then he showed he had disciples and showed them this is how you do it. This is how humanity was meant to live. Well, actually, this is how God intends humanity to live in a fallen world. Right? Because originally, God, there was no fallen world. 
Things are a lot easier when there's no fallen world. Right? And so Jesus says, Paul writes to us and says, be imitators of God. He, he, he writes to some believers and he says, follow me as I follow Christ. That, that's, that's pretty bold to say, you know what? If you just follow me, you do the things the way that I do it, you'll be okay because I'm following Christ. And that's the way it should be in our lives. People should, should, should be able to imitate us. Our children should be able to imitate us. And we don't have to worry about if they're going to follow Christ. Because we're following Christ. We're imitators. We're imitators of God. We show them how to do do it. When when you know economy or the money money is tight or the doctor says something, what are you imitating Christ or are we do are we imitating the world? When someone speaks ugly of you and you, and you have an opportunity to take revenge or forgive, do our children see us imitating Christ or do they see us imitating the world? And one of the things that we have to do as being imitators of, of God and imitator, imitating Christ and following his example is we have to see how Jesus did the things that he did. We have to walk by faith, faith in God, right? Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing and I only say what I hear the Father saying. And the issue, as we've been talking about, because we're on week five or six, I can't, I'm not sure, of this, is that we have received the faith of God. When you're born again, faith comes. It comes, and when you accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're born again, and now a fruit of your born-again spirit is the fr fruit of faith, right? Your spirit has faith in it. Whose faith does it have in it? Whoever created it. Who created your spirit? God. We have God's gentleness. We have God's love. We have God's joy. We have God's peace. You already have it in your spirit. And that's why he writes, walk in the spirit. It's not about trying to get peace. So many pa uh, patience. I need long suffering. People say stuff like, ah, I just need, need some patience. Well, don't say that. You're going to be in every traffic jam, every long line. You're going to no. God doesn't, that's, a, that's the flesh. That's self-discipline. Well, I'm just not going to get angry while I'm standing in this line. No, peace is something that comes from the inside out. You're, you're in peace. There's no anxiety. You're not falling apart every time something happens. There's just an inward peace that, that is in you. And, and, but we're talking about faith today. <laughs> And the issue, the issue is not that we don't have enough faith because God has given us faith. He's given us, every one of us, the measure of faith. Not a measure, the measure. We all have faith. If you're a born-again, spirit-filled believer sitting here today, you have the faith of God. So the problem isn't faith. The problem is our faith gets contaminated. It gets polluted. And how does our faith get polluted? With doubt and unbelief. I, I was going to bring a, a glass of water up here today. And I was going to, a nice clear glass of water. And I was going to say, this glass of water represents faith. And then I was going to take a tea bag and throw it in that water. And then I was just going to let it go and go and go. At first, there would just be a little bit of color coming into that water. But the longer it goes, that water would be polluted with that tea. Is it still water? Yeah. But it's been contaminated with tea. That's the same thing it is with, our, with faith. We have the faith of God. But through the flesh, through the five physical senses, through the outward influences on us, it little by little contaminates our faith. We let doubt and unbelief come in. 
And if you don't understand that, you're going to see it clearly as we look at these examples in Scripture. So our problem is not that we don't have faith. It's, isn't that good news? Isn't it good news to know that I don't have a faith problem? I have faith. If I'm born again, I have faith. And if I'm, if I'm not born again, guess what? God's got the faith for me to be born again. He's offering it to me by His grace. The problem is, is we just have too much unbelief. Let's look at, well, let's look at again. We're going to look at uh, Jesus and the disciples and see how this, this played out in their experience. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 14, it says, that, um, When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him, saying, Again, just a refresher, Jesus was up on the, the Mount of Transfiguration, where he shone like the sun from the inside out, right? And now they're coming back down from this experience, and he only had um, Peter, James, and John with him. The other disciples were down at the bottom of the mountain, and there was a crowd there, and they came up to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, because he has seizures and suffers terribly, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. They were disciples. What's a disciple? It's one that's being trained by a teacher. Right? So, matter of, so that's saying that Jesus taught the disciples to cast out demons. Right? And they, and they couldn't cure him. And Jesus answered and said to them, Oh, that's all right. It wasn't God's will for this boy to be healed. No, what did he say? See, if I treated, I'd be the only one here if I treated everybody the way that Jesus treated, treated them. What did he say? He said, Jesus answered and said to him, You unbelieving and perverse generation. He's talking to his disciples. How long... Shall I be with you? In other words, how long do I have to do everything for you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. See, if you're touchy feely, you don't, you don't, this doesn't play well, right? If, if, you, if you're a person that thinks in your spiritual way, you blame everything on God. This doesn't play well. We don't do that, though. We don't, we don't blame things on God. It, and Jesus was actually upset in the disciples' inability to heal this boy. He was upset with their inability to heal this boy. And what's interesting about this is here this boy had a demon... And was it God's will for the boy to be healed? It was. But the boy wasn't being healed. So that shows that there are things that are God's will in the earth that don't happen because of something on our part. Do you see that? God's will for, was for this boy to be healed. But the, disi the, the disciples could not heal him. And Jesus berated them for not being able to heal them. And then we're going to see that Jesus heals him. In verse 18, And Jesus rebuked the, re rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why? Could we not cast him out? You know, it, it, it's interesting. Again, we, we got to get this out of our, our religious mind. Jesus didn't tell the disciples, the reason you couldn't cast him out is because it wasn't God's will for you to cast him out. Jesus gives them a reason why they couldn't cast him out. So again, this shows that there are things that happen in the earth that aren't God's will. God, if, if Jesus wasn't there and that boy continued to live with that demon, it was not God's will. It's, it's, it's amazing how our religious mind just misses this stuff. But what the disciples did is they, they questioned. And this, this is so important. Because do you question? 
When we say that the promises of God have their yes and their amen already in Christ Jesus, and you are praying, you're believing, you, you are speaking God's word, you're, you're, you're using the faith that God has given, given to you, and you do not see the promise come to pass, what do you do? You say, well, must not have been God's will. We just seen that it was God's will, but it wasn't happening. Do you question? See, here's the thing about questioning. To question means that you have a relationship with God. See, a lot of Christians live their life almost independently. This is my faith. This is my, my, my believing. This is my confession. I'm doing the, this, and then hopefully God rewards it. See, there, that, that's, the, that's the two camps. You have two camps. You have, you have one camp that God is sovereign, and, well, it must not have been his will. And then you got another camp. Well, you must not have had enough faith. It's all dependent on you. No, it's a partnership. God is all-powerful. He is the sovereign one. He has given us his authority in the earth. And we walk by faith. Mm. So the disciples were questioning Jesus. Why couldn't we cast them out? That's something that we need to start doing. The problem is we don't like it because it causes intimacy. You have to get along with God. You have to have conversations with God. You have to believe that God hears your prayers and that God actually speaks back to you. Some of the times... (laughs) Our prayer life is all, all of us speaking to the one that has all the answers and not, and not listening, right? That's why I got to listen to my wife. She has all the answers. And, anyway. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. See, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus called the 12 disciples to him and he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. And to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases in Matthew chapter 10. So this was a shock to the disciples. Because they had seen demons cast out before. They had cast out demons before. They had healed the sick. They had seen diseases cured. And so they were wondering why, why can't we? Why couldn't we cast this one out? What happened? And not only did they receive power to cast out devils, but but they had... But when Jesus sent them out by the 72, two by two, to prepare the way for him, they had seen all of this stuff stuff happening. And the reason why they questioned is because they had never failed before. They had never failed before. They they, they, They had seen Jesus move in power to heal the sick and cast out demons. And they too followed in that power to cast out demons and heal the sick. So they knew that it was the will of God. Notice they never questioned God's will. Yet they believe and they yet they believed in their hearts, they spoke it out their mouths and put their the faith of God into action and nothing happened. Has any of us ever been there? Have you ever been there? Where you you feel like you did everything This is how it ends up being said to me. I have done everything that I know to do. And still. So what, why? Why? See, when we, like the disciples, believe in our hearts and speak the word out of our mouth to whatever mountain we might be facing, and we don't see the desired outcome, we should ask Jesus why. We should ask Jesus why. And the average Christian just says, well, it must not have been God's will. We don't ask the why. We don't have that intimacy with God. We, we, we even try to live our life of faith separate from God. God wants you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. John chapter 3. He, he, or Jeff, John 3. <laughs> Excuse me. He wants you to prosper in every area of your life. Financially, he wants you to be wealthy. Do you know that God wants you to be wealthy? And what is wealthy? 
Wealthy is having all your needs met and being able to bless others. That doesn't sound like a bad thing, does it? God wants you to be prosperous. Spirit, soul, and body. He wants you to be health, healthy and not hindered by sickness. God wants you to be in peace and joy and not oppressed or in despair. That's the will of God for humanity. And if, this, if you're religious, this is going to come to a shock to you. There are many things that happen on earth that are not God's will. We just read one. There are many things that happen on the earth that are not God's will. Many of this is happening because humanity is reaping what they sow. They're sowing and reaping in the earth. And that includes you and I. And some of us need to pray for a crop failure. Most Christians' thought pattern is not one that's guided by the, by the principles, the constants, the, the laws that govern faith, but more on luck and wishes. We prefer the casino God, where you just put, put your prayer in and you pull the lever and hopefully God comes out. The gospel does not teach this foolishness. God's ways are higher than our ways, and we have to learn His ways. Jesus echoed the will of the Father. Jesus was the echo of of God. If you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the perfect, the perfect manifestation of what God is like. And Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore. You can find that in Mark chapter 28 and Mark 16. God, Jesus has received all authority both in heaven and earth, and now we are to go therefore under his delegated authority into the earth. And two of the major fantasies or falsities many Christians embrace is the idea that whatever happens, happens. And God is in control. If that's, (laughs) I'm not going to get into that too much, but that's that's just foolishness to think that everything that's happening in Earth today. Then there's no there's no there's no reason to stand against abortion because it couldn't happen unless God willed it. Religion is (laughs) fool. Foolish, foolish, foolish. But then there's the other side of the coin. Those that make, it, make you feel like it's all up to you. That you are the one that can manipulate and control God with your faith. We already learned it's not your faith. We, are, we just echo what God has said back to God. Just like the, His word comes down like rain to the earth. We, we echo that, that back, to, back to him. God has provided all his promises by his grace and has given. He has provided us the faith to receive those promises, but the flesh can void the laws of faith, working in your life through unbelief, polluting faith. You understand that? Your spirit does not have unbelief in it. Your spirit does not have any doubt in it. All spirit, all doubt and unbelief comes from the flesh. You know, in, in one of the other one of the other gospels accounts of this demon boy that the disciples couldn't cast out, it actually says that the the boy manifest and went into a full blown seizure right in front of Jesus when this happened. And I'm pretty sure that's probably what happened to the disciples too. That they went to cast him out and all of a sudden the, that demon manifest in that boy. They had the faith to heal that boy but their five physical senses were telling them something different. 
See, we need to understand that when, when, when you're ministering to other people, um, their faith does play a part in it. You can't, you can't receive for somebody else based on your faith. They have to have, you see this played over and over in Jesus' life. You see that the people that Jesus ministered had to have some type, some type of faith, faith in it. You know, there was a time in Mark chapter 6 where, where Jesus um, couldn't do many mighty works except, except they laid a hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled at their unbelief. There again, we see Jesus. Was, was it God's will to heal those people? Yes, but he couldn't. Why? Because of their unbelief. See, we see clearly in ministry, the ministry of Jesus, the faith has to be present on our part, and it has to be on part of the person that we're ministering to also. But what about those times where, where you believe that, that you're believing and, and you believe that faith is there and, and you're still not receiving? See, that's where the disciples were. The disciples were believing. They were trying to cast out this demon and he, and, and he would not be cast out. When we used our faith, we, we acted on it. We spoke to our mountain, but we didn't get the results. See, this is where the disciples were. And, and Jesus answered their question. Jesus answered their question. In Matthew 17, verse 20, so Jesus said to them, this is after they asked the question, why couldn't we cast them out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. He didn't say because you didn't have faith. He said because of your unbelief. You, scripture shows that you can have faith and unbelief at the same time. Why? Why can you have faith and unbelief at the same time? Because faith is a product of your spirit, and unbelief is a product of your flesh. The Bible calls it being double-minded in James. And a double-minded person can't expect to receive anything from God, it says. So he says, he says Jesus says to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, he's saying, see, you can have a little tiny, tiny faith. It's not about how much faith you have. You can have mustard sized faith. You could say to this mountain, be moved from here to there, and it will be moved, and nothing will be impossible to you. Do we believe the words of Jesus? He says, it doesn't matter. You can have little faith. You don't need to have a whole bunch of faith. But you can't have any unbelief. You can't allow your flesh to contaminate your faith. You have to be spiritual people. You have to walk in the Spirit. See, it doesn't take great faith to do great things. That's good. That should be good news. You don't need great faith. You just need to use the faith that you have. It just takes less unbelief. Less of the flesh. Because your unbelief, the flesh works against your spirit. The flesh works against faith. Right? That's what, Ro that's what Paul talked about, how they, there's a war inside of us. Our flesh warring against our spirit. The things that we want to do, we don't do. And the things we do, 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 do want to do, we don't do. There's a war. Who's going to be in control of your life? Is your spirit going to be in control or is your flesh going to be in control? That's why Jesus, Jesus never told his disciples that they needed more faith. Jesus never told his disciples he needed more faith. And if Jesus never told anybody they, they needed more faith, then we shouldn't tell anybody, you just, you just need more faith. We need to encourage them that you already have the faith of God. You have faith. But you got your eyes on the wrong, on the wrong thing. The issue is not one of faith, but of unbelief. You can have faith and doubt in your heart at the same time. And like I said, James calls this a double-minded person. Jesus answered to his disciples, and his answer to us is believe only. Believe only. In Mark chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. Was it, was it a lack of faith? That's going to stop it from happening? No, it's doubt. 
We need to be honest with ourselves. This father, we're going to read this in just a bit, if you guys give me enough time. The, this father said, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. It is, uh, it is amazing how arrogant Christians are when it comes to the topic of, 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 of doubting. They're, 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 off- they're offended with the idea that maybe the reason we're not receiving is because of so- something that's, we're not single-minded on our end. We, we like to think, it, has, it can't be me. It has to be God. And we create all sorts of strange and weird and cruel doctrines to support our unbelief. He says, And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Do you know something? I've never cast a sea into the, uh, a mountain into the ocean. I never moved a, moved a mountain before. Want to know why? I'll be honest with you. My unbelief. I believe God can do it. I just don't believe God can do it through me. <laughs> can we be honest? There, there's certain things that happen in our life that, you, that, that you're, we struggle with unbelief. And instead of hiding in our unbelief, we should go get a brother or sister and, and be honest with you. And... and, and Confess our sin to one another. What's, what is sin? Sin is, it means to miss the mark. Miss the mark of what? Miss the mark of God's perfection. Right? And then if we're unbelief, we're missing the mark. We need to confess to one another. You know, this has happened in my life, and I just feel like I, got, I must have unbelief, or I, or I know I have unbelief. Pray with me. Encourage me. That's, that's what the body of Christ is for. Let's look, look at another example. Real quick here. What time is it? We'll look at this and then we'll pause for next week. In Mark chapter 5, verse 36, it says, And and as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. This was Jairus. He was a ruler, and his, his daughter was sick at home, and he came to find Jesus. He, he operated his faith. Jesus can heal my daughter. And you know the story. Jesus was being surrounded by the crowd. And a woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus. And he stopped. And he healed that woman. And he talked to her and, and all that. And then all of a sudden, one of his servants came and said, Don't bother the master anymore. Your, your daughter is dead. There's a lot of things that could have went through Jairus' mind. He could have thought, just sorrow, my daughter's dead. He could have thought, that woman, if that woman wouldn't have stopped Jesus. There's so many things that could have went through his head. And right as soon as as soon as those words came out of that servant's, servant's mouth, what did Jesus say? He says, do not be afraid, believe only. See, there are things that happen in our lives all the time. We're tragedy, and and things things come. And we we have an opportunity to look at everything that's going on in the physical world, or we can believe only in Jesus. We can believe only in Jesus. And if if, if it says believe only, only believe, only believe, only believe, that means that you you could believe in doubt. He says, singular, only, only believe. And we know the story. His, his, his daughter was raised, raised from the dead. One more example, one more example. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on, on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, and and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, can man me to come out to you on the water? 
Right? Let's pause right here. Was it God's will for Peter to walk on the water? Did Jesus say, hey, Peter, why don't you join me on the water? No. What did Peter say? All right, Jesus, if that's really you, tell me to come out on the water. It was, it was never God's will for Peter to walk on the water. What Peter did is he used his faith. If, the, if Jesus, if that's you and you're walking on the water, then, then tell me to come out on the water. Again, here's something that God didn't will. Peter put himself in this pickle, right? He does that a lot. And what was Jesus supposed to say? Well, it's not me, Peter, so don't come out on the water. He had to say, it is I. Come on, let's go. And, and verse 29, so he said, come. Come on. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. This is awesome. But when he saw, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter was walking on the water to Jesus. But when he seen the winds boisterous, what did the wind have anything to do with him being able to walk on the water? It had nothing to do with it. If it was a calm day and the wind wasn't blowing at all, would that be easy? Is that easier? That's easier to walk on the water on a calm day than it is. <laughs> and he started to sink. Was it God's will for Peter to sink? No, it wasn't God's will. What did he do? He took his eyes off the Word, who is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. And he looked at all his external circumstances. And he started to sink. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus said Peter only had little faith. Right? How much faith does it take to move up a mountain? A mustard seed. See, the reason Peter had little faith, yet he walked on water with that little faith. This proves that it doesn't take a huge amount of faith to receive from God. Right? He only had little faith. And he could walk on water. And, 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 and his problem... Peter's problem wasn't his lack of faith, but rather his unbelief. That's what Jesus said. He said, you of a little faith, why did you doubt? His doubt, his unbelief contaminated his faith. It took his eyes off Jesus. It took his eyes off the promise. It took the word that said, come. There was, there was, enough, there was enough faith in God, Jesus, who is God, saying, come. For him to walk all, all the way to shore on the water. It, he says, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? It wasn't the lack of faith that was the issue. It was the doubting that was the issue. It was the doubting. P Peter's little faith would have taken him all the way to Jesus and back to the boat if he had never doubted. And again, G by G Jesus rebuking or correcting Peter and saying, you have little faith, why did you doubt? That shows that it was never God's will for Peter to sink. Right? But he sunk. So again, things happen in the earth that's not God's will. See, we got to get rid of this notion that we, we need big faith to receive from God. That's not it. Simple faith in Jesus. Simple faith in Jesus' all-encompassing work is sufficient in receiving any promise from God if there isn't unbelief to counter it. Unbelief is an opposing force that negates faith. People aren't born again because of their unbelief. It negates the faith of salvation because of their unbelief. 
So how did Peter, again, you should know this by now, but how did Peter pollute his faith? He looked at circumstances. He looked at the ways. He looked at what is happening in the natural. Not only that, but what do you think was going through his mind? Was he, was he spiritually minded at that moment, or was he carnally minded at that moment? He was carnally minded. He had man's wisdom going. He, he was a fisherman. He, he, he's been out on those water before. He says men, men, men aren't supposed to be walking on water. And worldly wisdom contaminated what he knew about Jesus. Peter took his eyes off Jesus. He put it on the wind and the waves. Unbelief came through his natural senses, the flesh, and that brought him down. And it does it to us too. It does it to us too. That's what we were talking about last week. You've got to be very careful of what you're feeding on. You've got to be careful of what you're feeding on. If it's stealing your joy, if it's, if, it's, it's, if it's putting fear, anxiety, unbelief into your life, if, if it's causing you to, to not to, to doubt about God is good, you, you, you need to stop feeding on that. You've got to get alone with Jesus. The flesh is what brings us down all the time. As long as Peter didn't pay attention to the wind and waves, he walked on water. Looking at circumstances took his attention off Jesus and put them on the natural realm. Notice it was not sinful thoughts that caused him to sink. It wasn't sinful thoughts that caused the promises of God not to happen in his life. It was natural thoughts. It was, na- it was thoughts that were contrary to what God had said. It, brought, he, he, it was his surroundings that brought him back to thinking naturally. And you can't walk on the water thinking naturally. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to stop right there. Yes? Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that and that's one and that's one of the, that's one of the dangers of um, focusing on the amount of faith you have. Right? It's not about your amount of faith. It's 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 God. The reason why a mustard seed grain of faith can can move a mountain is because it's not your faith. It's it's God working through you. It's God working through you. And it, and it's so easy to especially if you start having results. Especially when things are going good, it's easy to start thinking that I'm the one producing this. I'm the, you know, by the things that I've done, my prayer life, my reading the Bible, my, you know, I've seen people healed before. And it's, it's a dangerous ground. Success is dangerous. Success is dangerous. I see this all the time. A lot of people think, uh, well, when, when everything goes bad, that's what you find out what people believe, believe about God. No. I think 
it says it's a lot more telling when everything's going good. That's when you find out what people believe about God. Are they still trusting God? Are they still walking by faith? Are they still praising God and worshiping Him, giving Him the glory for everything that's happened in this in your life? And yeah, that's a good that's a good word. Yep. Why couldn't we cast them out? Well, you 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 can't cast them out anyways, right? It's only the power of God working working in you. And that's one of the that's an, that's another thing that plays into that plays into that unbelief and doubt is when you start thinking that you're the one that's doing it, it's easy to doubt. It's easy to have unbelief. If if you're the one if you're thinking that I have to somehow have enough faith to reach up and get healing for my own body and bring it down. That's ridiculous. Ridiculous. I don't have the power power to bring healing down from, from God. But when, but when your faith is totally raptured, taken up in who Jesus Christ is, and that he, he is my healer, and that by his stripes I was healed, and that that Spirit of Christ lives within me, and now it's about it's about uh, receiving what I already have rather than trying to get something I don't have, because God has already done it. It's 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 good. This is important. Walking by faith. I, there's a lot of people that have heard heard the, these types of things before, and it's. I want to caution you. Not to listen to this and, and think, well, I already know this. I already heard this or, or something like that. Because we want to get results. And, and when, we, when we, we have the ability to, to what, 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 how do I say this? To not degrade the Word of God, but not value the Word of God the way, the way that we should. What's that? Diminish, yes, because we have head knowledge in things. But we need more than head knowledge. We need working knowledge. We need to, to experiential knowledge in these, in, in these things. And uh, um, so I'm just telling you, I without a doubt can say that any failure to receive anything from God is 100% on my part. And I need and when that happens, I need to get alone with Jesus and ask him why. Right? And get an answer, not just say why and then walk away and just forget about it, but actually get get an answer. God has never failed me once. And as we as, as we've seen in these gospels, God he has, he has never failed anyone once. But when we get our minds and our thoughts on the circumstances and the things that are happening around the world, the things that are happening in our own minds, from our own experiences. Do you know how many people I hear that, that say, well, I know so-and-so was a godly person and, and they didn't get healed or they, they had this happen to them? God loves that, that godly person. I love that godly person, but that godly person's not my savior. They're not my example. My example is Jesus and Jesus alone. And, 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 and it sounds very cruel. It sounds very cruel to, to be that way to people. But, but the, the truth of the matter is that's, that's the only thing that leads to vic victory is Jesus. It's not, it's not your relatives. It's not this super duper Christian that you idolized or, you know, so you see that stuff happen. You see these great men, women of faith that, that they fall into sin or something. And you think to yourself, well, if they can't make it, how can I make it? Because they got their eyes off Jesus. Now you get your eyes off them and put them on Jesus. That's, that's, that's what it, we, we, we put these people up on pedestals. There's only one pedestal and, and only Jesus is on it. And, and so we just need to start being honest with each other. And, and again, I say this quite often, but stop playing church and being the church. And there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, this is happening in my life and I don't, I think my, my feel like my faith is contaminated. I'm nervous. I'm anxious. I, I, I don't know. I don't 
believe, I don't believe how God's going to do this. Fix this. Right? And then we can come along each other and encourage each other and build each other up. Amen? I'll stop talking. I talk too much. You've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church. For more information or to contact us, go to www.karisntc.org. And remember, you are deeply loved, highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.